Hello, welcome back to Unemployed Film Snobs. My name is Brian Delgado. I'm Joshua Mejia. And I'm Joshua Latona. And today we have another episode. This time we thought about auteurs, filmmakers. So the idea is this year there's been a lot of films that have come out recently. Uh, Scorsese, you know, David Fincher's The Killer coming out. And, you know, a, a part of what we wanted to discuss today is uh, what makes an auteur film, filmmaker. Um, we're going to get really controversial, maybe, on, on the topic of what the definition means, but uh, we're going to have a really good episode today. So right now, what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and drive, and I'm going to let uh, Josh Mejia take over and just yeah. do uh, your thing, man, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. All right, well, to start, uh, there's been a, there's a couple of definitions of our tours. They're all really the same thing. Like to be honest, this kind of get they get they get either very specific or very general. Uh, but the main definition is that uh, 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 the film theory of an auteur is essentially a film director as the author of the film. They um, have like a certain vision that they want to get across, and that's like exactly what the cinematographer does. That's exactly what communicates to the actors. So that that's the main theory. And it originally developed in France in the 1950s as a part of the French New Wave. Um, it was heavily promoted by uh, some French filmmakers by the name of François Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, who some of you may know of. Um, if not, there are some incredible directors, and I highly recommend their work. But they originally kind of uh, discussed this in their uh, cinema journal, as what they called it in France, which is basically just like a review, you know, a, a review journal for films. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if you know me, I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation because I suck at pronouncing foreign names, but it was called Cahiers de Cinema. I'll uh, put the, the title somewhere right here um, in the video. But yeah, so that that's basically it. And there's one definition though that's more general. And I think that it probably goes to more of our discussion for today, mm -hmm. which means that, the, that simply put, the auteur theory is that the director has a signature um, across the whole of the film. And I think that can be said about a lot of directors, especially the ones we just mentioned, like David Fincher, Martin Scorsese, like especially The Killer. Like The, the Killer, I think, is a very David Fincher film. Yeah. So from there, I think we can... Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Latona to kind of just do, continue discussing, you know, like what, what type of American filmmakers do you think would you consider our tours? Yeah, I mean, look, look, uh, there's a lot... I mean, there's a lot that I think we can consider, right? And a lot yeah. this year, as Brian's already mentioned, like just to bring up a few more, like Wes Anderson and Sofia Coppola, other big people uh, that are, you know, having movies this year. And I think the best way to kind of lay it out um, as we kind of give our, like, 101 intro class to, <laughs> like, our tours, it's just, uh, I, in, in our pre-meeting, we were like, well, let's just kind of lay out, like, three people that, like, fundamentally are different, but, like, really represent, like, what we mean when we say out tour, right? So, yeah, like, yeah, especially with like with just the, just the definition of you know a director whose signature is on the whole film and his work, his work as a whole, you know, he has a certain certain style to himself or to herself. Yeah, so like for starters, I mean, we already brought up Martin Scorsese, who yeah. we've already had a whole episode about, so we don't have to get too de too in deep with him. Yeah. But right. you know, I think what makes him really good is that he's like very versatile. I think. Yeah. Like he has a signature style, but is able to kind of like blend that to like new uh, new perspectives and genres. Yeah. Right? Like that's the other thing. Like yeah. Like and I think no, not necessarily, but like. Some like some if you compare Hugo with his other movies, they don't always feel the same, and I actually think yeah. that's a really good thing. Yeah. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon feels totally fresh in comparison to The Irishman, and that's really exciting. Um, the other one we also brought up was David Fincher. Uh, you mentioned The Killer, which um, again, like if you watch all of David Fincher's like filmography, he has a very signature style. Yeah, very like just clean cut like. I don't know, I feel like yeah, the best way to describe it is like kind of like military. Like mm. it's just straight to the point and like there's always like those like, not rumors because we know it to be true where it's like in the, in um, the Zodiac Killer in the movie. Yeah. Uh, there was one scene where uh, Jake Hillenwall's character literally just tosses down his, his notebook, his like uh, sketching notebook. Mm. And I heard that they did it like 47 times. Oh, I didn't they, know they, that. They wanted a, like Fincher wanted a specific way for the notebook to land so they did it 47 times. Yeah, and I, I mean, if, if you, w like, watch or listen to any of, like, David Fincher's commentaries, like, he talks about how much of, like, a perfectionist he is, yeah. and that he'll and, do, and, like, crazy number of takes yeah. to get the actors to get, like, a certain level of tiredness so the, like, the lines sound exactly the way he wants them to. 
And yeah, and I, th I think that points out to an Artur in both definitions of it. Like, because he has a signature look and a signature style, like a feel mm -hmm. throughout all of his pictures. But also that, you know, he is like the sole creative vision of the entire uh, project. Yeah. And like, honestly, that's like felt across all his films. And again, just like, I, I again, what's different between him and Scorsese is Scorsese, I think, finds a way to like remix himself in a lot of interesting ways. While Fincher is like, when I go see a David Fincher movie, I know exactly like the hallmarks and things to expect. And he just like, his vision feels so fresh on the stories he's telling, right? Yeah. And I think the last uh, kind of like the big, the round out like our little three here is another David who is completely different from mm -hmm. these two um, is David Lynch, right? Yes. Um, who is a director who still mesmerizes me and has me asking questions to this day about what any of his films are actually about. Um, very dreamlike, constantly. Um, Surreal. Like very... Uh, fever dream. Yeah, mm -hmm. very um, Salvador Dali, if anyone's into painting. Yeah, and I just... I, I think, like, I just wanted to bring those three up as, like... The ear's like an umbrella of, like, just, like, what an auteur could be. Because it doesn't necessarily always have to be this person that, like, has a, a very uh, consistent style like Scorsese, but can be also pushed into the weird and obscure, like, um, you know, like David Lynch, who just like, if you watch any of his movies, like I, when people always ask me for an introduction, I'm just like, start with Blue Velvet, you know? Mm. Like, it's just a classic, uh, perfect, I, and mo most people regard it as his best anyway, uh, David Lynch movie to go into just because of its like weird en energies yeah. and very specific shots. <laughs> And, like, again, I was, like, watching, like, the commentary on that. And the way, like, David Lynch even just comes up with, like, small decisions. It's just because he's, like, I really like that and we're just going to do it. Like, it doesn't it doesn't feel like, you know, he's necessarily, like, Fincher having to, like, pick everything early. Um, and I just find that really interesting. And I, I, I want to, like, leave some room here for, for yeah. Brian to kind of hop in and just sort of, like, I don't know if there's... I know there's a lot we kind of left on, on the <laughs> table here. But kind of just feel free to, like get into like I don't know anyone you're like from anyone you're thinking of that could be good so when we talked about this episode I, I was thinking about Jordan Peele mm -hmm. uh, because Jordan Peele has like a certain way of uh, kind of subverting tropes <laughs> in yeah. horror and you know mind you like this is a guy who did like comedy so the way so he already has like three films out and I I, I would argue that he is a not tour filmmaker at this point um, I would even argue that you don't even need to have three three films uh, really in your in, in your disposal, but that's a that's a different topic, right? Uh, but yeah, like the way Jordan Peele just, mm, I think it's just like the style as well. It's not even just like the way he film makes. It's just like the way he writes. He creates a story where it kind of leaves you guessing as to what is really going on, especially with us and Nope, and. Or even Get Out, too. Uh, actually, all three of them. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Um, he... I don't know the right words to describe his movies. And even up to the, even up to now, it's like... I, I'm still thinking about them sometimes. And I'm wondering to myself, like... Is he trying to say something to us? Is he... I don't know. I, I think it's, like, very satirical. And it's also, like, a parody uh, to, to society nowadays. So I feel like it's, like, that type of filmmaking. Um, which I'm not saying other filmmakers don't do that, but his like really stands out, especially in horror. And I, also another thing, I'm glad you brought him up too, because I, I think we talked about Spielberg a little bit um, in our pre-meeting. But like, you know, Jordan Peele's very Hollywood. All his movies are under Universal. You know, yeah. and that's like the difference between like some of these other directors we're talking about, right? Like David Lynch. Like I, I don't, I'm not totally. Sh I don't think he's ever worked with like a major studio. No. Um, and, you know, I, I, sorry, I'm losing my trace of thought, but uh, basically just that, like, Jordan Peele, like, represents, like, how you can do, like, kind of this auteur high art at a Hollywood level in a way that, like, Spielberg, um, you know, here and there does, for sure. Yeah. And I, I just find that really interesting. Like, again, it's, like, this whole umbrella of just, like, here are these filmmakers working at different levels of, like, the Hollywood system between indie, the sort of mid-budget range, and, you know, I know Scorsese's basically made a 220 million dollar movie but still like a movie that like 
you know, is carved out its own, like, kind of space, you know, and Jordan Peele's just another great example of, like, fitting in there. Yeah, yeah and, like, when you mentioned, uh, when you talk about Jordan Peele right now, about creating, like, satirical stuff or things that kind of reflect society, that is very reminiscent of the French New Wave, too. And, like, the, mm. the filmmakers I talk about, like, Truffaut, like, his, uh, I believe his film, The 400 Blows, his stuff was very reminiscent of, like, just how, like, 400 Blows felt was pretty much, like, a story about him and how he grew up, his childhood and everything him being in jail as a kid I believe um and so like I think that you know I think you definitely say and I mean I'll, I'll have to agree to disagree with the whole like you know you don't need three films to kind of see yourself and see the filmmaker as an auteur is this debate coming back up is our pre-meeting debate <laughs> <laughs> well only because like because I because like if they have one movie two movies yeah but it's like, I feel like you really need three or even four movies to really see how their style is developing and like becoming their own you know, I think we talked about this with Saltburn. Oh, and okay. That's something that, that oh, you brought Saltburn. up. So I'll, I'll just leave that. I'll, I'll let you take that one over. Without getting too much into it, because I want to save at least the Emerald Fennel stuff to the end. I think, like, the best way to kind of I look at it is, like, I get what you mean. Is like, you want the filmmaker to kind of have enough projects under their belt to, like, really develop a sense of their self. So we as an audience understand what makes that movie theirs, right? Yeah. Or if you want to go with the other more original definition of what a tour is, or it's just someone that, <laughs> that well, because there's many different defini definitions, but that's why. So that, that I'm just trying to keep it the, the broad here very wide in general. Yeah. Because you know those one where it's like you know the, their signatures across the whole film and across the whole work, you can tell the signature like Scorsese. You know, and like the other definition, which is the one that was more promoted during the French New Wave, was that like the whole vision and the whole vision and the way the film was sculpted was, was solely that director you know it was solely like this is what they wanted you know and this is what they got yeah. so so that, that I'm just trying to keep it broad here <laughs> for sure yeah. and that's why I say like when I think like we're saying like when does a filmmaker become auteur and I think that's probably a good way to round yeah. out the discussion is when we kind of like realize like who they are as a director yeah. right which is like I get like off the bat, it's hard to like label somebody who's done one or two movies and not to work because it's like, well, did they develop a, 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 a sort of yeah. self or like a, a recognizable sort of like, this is what makes a David Fincher movie, this is what makes a Martin Scorsese movie, right? I would say that sometimes though, like, I think a director comes out swinging hard enough yeah. where you can pick up on those things and at least in two movies, yeah. you can figure that out. Uh, not not yeah. that there's always like, yeah. like a counter. Of right, like of like, oh, they had to have done three, but sometimes it happens. Where I think like, you know, like Jordan Peele. After us, I was like, I think I understand what a Jordan Peele movie is now. Yeah, yeah I was, no, I, I got that same I, feeling. I, I was just about to say that word. So with Jordan Peele, and not even after us, I think even after Get Out, like he was so different. Mm -hmm. And even though he came from a com, um, com, comedy, comedy background, yeah, uh, like there was some quotes from him that said that you know that there's not really much difference between comedy and horror. That you know you maybe you leave out uh, like the yeah. punchline or something yeah. like that. Like, I can't remember the exact quote. Maybe I'll. I remember I'll, that. I'll, 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 I remember. I'll, rather, it's the framing, maybe you yeah. know, because there is a punchline in horror. It's yeah. just a very different one. Yeah, maybe well, maybe that's the quote. Something like that. I'll, I'll find it and leave it in here somewhere. But uh, yeah, like I, like you may have to get out. It was such a different piece of filmmaking that you could. Says, I, I kind of see what, he, what he's trying to go with his career, like what with his filmmaking career, you know. So I'll, I'll even argue that you know maybe it's, there's some directors where you can kind of see it from the fir first movie. Was like, all right, there's little touches of what you know he's trying to go for for his style, you know, like 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 you know if you think about foreign films like Truffaut or Godard or Tchaikovsky, Bresson, Bergman, like with their first films, you can definitely tell. All right, you know, you know their influences, you know, you know where, all right, you know they're being inspired by these guys. And, inspired you know the taking from here like like Tarantino says you're still from the best and you make it your own mm -hmm. you know so I think uh, I would like I would say that you know sometimes with some directors you can kind of tell that oh they're on the path of becoming our tour right from the get-go ah uh, yeah Tarantino is a great example of an that tour we you you, brief, you briefly mentioned that as well yeah. like the raunchy uh, grind house, grind house style. style yeah but I mean, like you can see his influences clear as day but he does make it his own, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, like, the whole point. I mean, if you, if you go all the way back to, 
you know, uh, Kurosawa, you know, like Scorsese talks about Kurosawa so much. I mean, he, uh, Scorsese was in uh, Kurosawa's Dreams, another great film if you guys want to watch it. He played Vincent Van Gogh, you know, so you can see all these influences. You can see where all these filmmakers are interacting with each other and everything. And I think it's pretty cool to see, you know, I think uh, Tarantino, I put it well, was like you just steal from the best and you make your own and you just take it in a modern way. You know, you use the tools that you have available now that maybe they didn't have available back then to, you know, turn it into something that they probably couldn't even think of. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, this is something, this is something that we didn't discuss uh, as like a subtopic, I would say, but is there like, do you guys feel like there is a filmmaker out there that has not tour and realizes it and then switches the style up, like completely Ooh, changes that's it? that's a good question. Ooh. That you know what I'm very, saying? Yeah. Like, I, I literally thought about that because it's like, there's always like those people that are like, well, I don't want people to remember my work as a certain way. Like, let me go ahead and switch it up. Let me change that, right? Um, is there is there anybody that comes into mind? Could I mean, an argument be made for M. Night, maybe? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, that's he, a good one. He may not be the most amazing filmmaker, but I don't know. He does change it up movie to movie. But he always tries to do a major plot twist. No, I disagree so, with that. He has he, 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 significantly he, he, in his no, last yeah. couple movies. You know, one would argue that if, that's the reason why some people don't even like M. Night anymore is because they're always expecting like this big plot, plot twist, twist at the end of the mm-hmm. movies. Well, and yeah. not all of them have that. Yeah, so. I guess not. Yeah, because they're just re- um, recollecting Knock at the Cabin. It didn't really have a plot twist. Everything was kind of laid out for you pretty well. Yeah. Or like, it wasn't like, whoa type of thing. You, you kind of figure it out at some point with the characters, so... And even some of yeah. his earlier works, like, Signs doesn't have, like, a big plot twist That's necessarily. True. Or old. Or old, yeah. Like, but the you rules know, are laid out. But you know what's... You, okay, so, like, as a... I'm, fi- I'm a fan of Shyamalan. Like, I am. I don't care. Um, there are those controversial oh, no, yeah, like, he's, movies. He's definitely a great filmmaker, I would say. You know, he, yeah. I and funds his, his movies pretty much himself. So, almost fitting our general definition right yeah yeah i mean what i was going to say as well is uh, his movies are i i think me so i think briefly like he kind of was known for the plot twist and i think uh just like bit by bit he just kind of um uh, does like a plot twist but like within like the whole the whole story itself i don't know if i'm explaining this correctly but i feel like what he's doing with his um how do I explain it? Well, like this might be a stretch, but I mean it might help you. I don't know, but would you kind of consider M Night Shyamalan might be a huge, huge stretch, a stretch, but to be kind of like a modern day version of like a Hitchcock? <sighs> yes and no. Yeah. Cause, mm-hmm. Like yeah. <laughs> Because I was just thinking about that right now, just because Hitchcock was known for suspense, uh-huh. you know, whereas, like, I mean, he has, like, that whole Alfred Hitchcock Presents series, which yeah. is basically the precursor to The Twilight Zone, which had a lot of plot twists and a lot of, like, just, like, crazy shit in it, so. Yeah. You know, at some point, it's like, he does... So what I what I what I was thinking is I think the story itself is more is already a twist like when like if you read like the synopsis to movies like old, you know you kind of think to yourself okay well that already is like kind of twisty like the story yeah. itself like what do you, what do you mean like people are just growing old on a beach mm-hmm. I, I think that itself is already twisty I be, but like. I feel like the story itself is already so interesting and so twisty that I don't think you need a plot twist because the story itself is already so, so twist twisty. I, I can't really I can't no, think no, of it. No, yeah. no, I get what you mean. It's, just, it's yeah. already so different. It's like so it's absurd. Like, yeah. it's, like, yeah. it's, like, yeah. it's absurd. It's so like, it's like, it's like when you're having a nightmare basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, I yeah. mean, it's just a consistent style. You know, I, I, I do think, well, I know what you mean by like him kind of switching up his style to be more absurd rather than having like a major plot twist in it. Yeah. Um, but like, so like in terms of M.I. Shyamalan too, like a lot of his movies, I feel like could only have been made by him. Mm-hmm. You know, like kind of like yeah. Fincher, but it's like, the, well, I saw The Killer like a week ago already. But that one, I thought when I watched it, I thought that, like, damn, like, this is something only Fincher could have made. Yeah. So, like... Even that, David Lynch. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, of course. Especially I mean, David Lynch, I mean, yeah. my, it was funny when you when you mentioned Blue Velvet as a good introduction to David Lynch, because my introduction to David Lynch was uh, Eraserhead. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so, Eraserhead, dude. I think you told me the story yeah. before, yeah. Yeah, my cousin showed it to me, and I, let's just, I did not know what was going on through 
all the movies. Like I'm just, like I haven't watched it since. It's been a while, but mm-hmm. that was my introduction to David Lynch. Just a little side side note thingy. No, but I want you to expand on, on, upon that for sure because I think this could be a good way to like kind of pivot a little bit. It's just um, you, you brought up because in our in a bit of our Saltburn, uh, you know, promising young woman debate in a previous, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll break it open a little bit later. Yeah. But you you brought up like a part of it has to be like the filmmaker or the film must feel like it was it could have only have been made by that filmmaker. Yeah. And I agree. Like. You know, it's like what's interesting with Fincher, right? Is that he made a girl with a dragon tattoo, which is technically a reboot, right? Yeah. Like there are three other three other ones, or at least that exist, mm-hmm. and he made that film only the way he could. Even though like there's a lot of similarities because they're using the sort the same source material. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't escape that. So I'm like curious, like if, uh, if we're gonna like just kind of name out films from some of our favorite auteurs, like what are what are some films that you feel like? only they could have made and I, I maybe that goes for their whole filmography but like if there's a really specific one that's like a really good example for each person oh actually i have a pretty good example just because it was remade mm-hmm. and pretty well hated like no one really liked it was pretty bad reception for it uh-huh. no one know why they, no one knew why they remade it uh-huh. so it was a film called the uh, solaris you know, pronounce it again i suck at pronunciation is this, like, is this a foreign yeah it's a foreign okay. film so originally a foreign film, it was made by one of my favorite directors. I mentioned him, I think, a bunch of times already. Andrei Tarkovsky. Mm-hmm. He's a Russian filmmaker who uh, made this film called Solaris. I think it's based off a book, if I'm not mistaken, a science fiction book. But they remade it. I don't know who remade it, but I know that George Clooney was in it. Um, and it wasn't well, well liked. And like when you watch the original Tarkovsky version. And you watch it like the the one that George Clooney was in. Yeah. You can tell the differences, right? Because like one is a lot more slow, slower plays. Because you know one is very poetic, like Tarkovsky. I think Tarkovsky's father was a poet too. Oh, like he, he like wrote a lot of poetry. I'm not sure if he was a professional poet, but it was very philosophical. You know, very like meditative, mm-hmm. right? About all, about a bunch of themes that had that they had in the book. So I would definitely say that where it's like I felt like Solar Risk could only have been made by Tarkovsky because the remake does not really touch upon what you know what Tarkovsky was able to bring out. Okay, I also have one. Uh, as you guys know, I am mm. a big Ryan Johnson fan. I even brought out the sweater for t- today's episode, <laughs> directed by Ryan Johnson and Knives Out font. My boy. Uh, but it, I, Knives Out is not the one I was going to say. Uh, is really the one that like only he could have made. Yeah. I agree. I, yeah, um, no, definitely. And it, it's not, it's actually not even that. I actually agree that it, like Knives Out is probably one of the best of his works. But if I'm going to use one as an example, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Brick. Brick? Oh, that's the one with Joe Singo to left. Yes, it's yeah. one of, uh, his, one of his from, early movies. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen no. it? I watched it a while ago. I, I watched it a while ago. I think like the log line is like, doesn't he find like a classmate dead or something? He find he basically finds a uh, his former his ex girlfriend dead and the it's so the whole movie set in a high school and it's basically a mystery noir and I feel like when I watched that movie only Ryan Johnson could have made it because it has such a unique sense of style that's coming from him. Like, uh, you could just see, like, the early seedlings of how he, like, gets the knives out in Glass Onion because mm-hmm. of the kind of the mystery of it all. Um, and it's not a very funny movie either, though. That's, like, the interesting part. Um, and it's, like, feels like a good in-between from, like, his stuff with, like, Looper and, like, the knives out. Like, it's like, kind of like a marriage of those two. Yeah. And, like, it is a movie uniquely I think only he could have made. Um, yeah, because it's, it's a mystery movie uh, framed as a noir. Like, all the performances are as if everyone's playing it like a like 1970s, like, investigative cop drama. You know, like, there's a scene where, like, basically Joseph Gordon-Levitt is, like, getting too close to things. And the principal, as, the chief, as if he were the chief of police, pulls him into his office. He's like, you're getting too close to this. You need to stop. Oh, I remember that scene. Yeah, yeah and it, it feels like a, like, the, like a chief of police telling the cop to stop getting, like, stop investigating. And it's like, this is such a unique, like, take on, like, just, like, a thriller. And it's all just, like, again, set in a high school. Joseph Gordon-Levitt at, like, at, like super young, so one of, like, his earliest movies. Um, and I think just a perfect example of, like, a movie that only that director could have made. Um, but, like, I'll toss it back to you. I don't know if you have one, Brian. I know this is 
one on to you. Yeah, and the, I, you know, it's weird. Like, I think just David Fincher's The Killer is like such a, it's a, such a David Fincher movie. Uh, the execution of it, I mean, it's literally and figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking dad jokes, man. Um, no, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't got much to say. I mean, if you know David Fincher's movies, uh, The Killer is just like a great example of it. Um, it was clean. It was... <laughs> I can't keep yeah. to say the execution. <laughs> but it was. It was really well done. And, you know, Michael Fassbender... It was executed phenomenally. <laughs> it was executed phenomenally. <laughs> um, uh, that and, like, I have a couple. So, I mean, I want to name... Um, yeah, you can find it, some M. Night Shyamalan's uh, Knock at the Cabin is such a Shyamalan movie. Mm-hmm. Especially because of the religious subtext. I feel like yeah. that's the one thing that... Yeah, because he always... Yeah, mm-hmm. go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, that's yeah. just like... Yeah, that's something that's in all his movies is like the religious subtext. Always. Like, even in Signs. Mm-hmm. Do you remember? Signs felt like a like a religious upbringing. <laughs> um, and I think Shyamalan does a great job with that. Uh, also... Uh, Peels, uh, yeah. Get Out. I think that's like, even though that was his first film, but I think that the the the, the, the satire on society, especially with like the liberals, the li- <laughs> liberals, uh, racial, this racial segregation going on. You know, is slavery still around? Like he kind of pulls like this sat- sat- satire on it. And you, you can't forget, like, the I would have voted for Obama for a third term <laughs> if, if I would have. I, I would have done that, you know. It, so th- those are the examples there. Um, but, yeah, I mean. I, uh, just kind of, yeah. like, not to get into it like we did with uh, one movie we chose, but are there any other, like, filmmakers or movies that, like, you can only been them. It's like a rapid fire type of thing. Oh, man. You, you know what's weird? I, I also want to shout out, like, Nolan's uh, Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. Like, I know that there's so many, like, Batman movies out, right? Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's a specific style that Nolan put into Dark Knight that I specific, uh, particularly like. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, like, more of this, like, grounded... Um, Just reality. Grounded reality, like, uh, twist to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could be honest. I mean, like, when he made Batman Begins, it was, like, a fresh, uh, like, fresh air yeah, for the like, superhero genre because the last Batman one, had been, like... Basically oh. burned to the ground by that yeah. point as like a brand. Yeah, I mean, during, so when Dark Knight came out, what was it like? Oh um, wait. Uh, yeah, oh wait, but like the last like Joker was what? Um, what was his name? Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson, right? Yeah, Jack Nicholson. And that was more of a and that was noir, noir like thriller. Too. Yeah. Like, like, oh, they tried to do like this like noir like uh, um, gothic, right? It was very gothic. Very I mean, it's gothic, converted. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, um, but. But I hope that that makes sense, like yeah, Nolan's no, 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 like no, no, Dark Knight movies, yeah, because yeah, yes. No. Yeah, no, no, you're right. You're yeah. right. I mean, for me, I think because you, I think you guys have the American or Western side covered. I'm gonna stick with the, the foreign filmmakers <laughs> here. But just the, like a, like rapid fire would be like uh, Amar Burzman Persona, which I think they're actually remaking. I don't know why they're remaking. Like a lot of these foreign film films that have been made by these master directors, they're remaking, and I don't like it. Well, don't you know the American audience needs to see it, but not in its original language uh, we can't read subtitles okay that's boring <laughs> but uh yeah so mr bergman's um persona and even um uh, uh the seventh seal mm-hmm. like i think those two were some you know or uh, or um, more famously i think people might know this one from the hbo show but scenes from marriage mm. uh which was remade with oscar isaac and jessica chastain was originally a uh, mr bergman movie more would you say movie? Because I think it was like in two parts, two or three parts. It was very long. But yeah, it was remade. So I think that's something too that was, you know, granted that the Oscar Isaac version was actually pretty good, but not as good as Demar Bergman's. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of directors that, you know, you can say that has their center style, you know, you can say that has um, like their, um, what's it called? That it could only be been made by them. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of directors out there, but but can you consider all those directors are tours is the question. Uh I mean like I look, I mean this was the joke that we were having in our pre meeting where when I pulled out like the Wikipedia list of film auteurs <laughs> we were debating well, how many like because obviously people can edit 
people, uh, you know, edit, like, names in. But, like, you know, a lot of them, like... Were questionable? Well, I was going to say a lot of them, like, were, like, definitely people, you know, you know, us would consider, like, auteurs. Like, you know, like, the name, a lot of the names we've already mentioned. And, yeah. You know, like... Spielberg, Scorsese, Nolan, you know. And just so many others, like, it's just to kind of, like, toss in, like, you know, like, again, you brought up Del Toro, like, another classic. Yeah. Um, totally just making movies that are of his own, you know? Um, but, like, I think that's just the thing is just... As long as they kind of keep to it, you know? Like, I think some people kind of peter off and just become a little more Hollywood, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes they sometimes they have to. Like, I know that, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, I think Gangs of New York was supposed to be, like, Scorsese's more Hollywood film so they can mm-hmm. get something else made. Or, I know he had, he had an instance like that. I'm not too sure why. I know for a fact that, like, Scorsese did make a more Hollywood film. Right, just to appease the studio, so that another film that he wanted to make more personal um, could get made. Yeah, essentially, I think a lot of directors have that. You know, I think you know what it is too is like, um, and this can kind of bring us to like our last segment, right? Um, which is like about people on the up and coming that we should definitely look out for. Yeah. But like, it's it's the danger of like, uh, I, I think there's like a lot of filmmakers, and I feel like the early 2015 era was doing a lot of this. Uh, where, like, a filmmaker who had made, like, one indie movie all of a sudden gets, like, hired to do, like, big blockbusters. Yeah. Um, you know, like, Colin Trevorrow, who looked really promising, um, you know, immediately gets Jurassic World and then, like, does the Book of Henry in between all that. Or, um, uh, the one who did Eternals, Chloe Zhao. Glo- yeah, Chloe who Zhao. Did, uh, oh, yeah. Who did, what's the movie she did before the Eternals? That got, like, Nomadland? Uh, no, yeah, Nomadland. That was a really great one. And then she did Eternals. So that's, I think that's another good example. And I, it's just, uh, you know, I guess you just have to be careful, right? Because that's, like, the thing. is like, I'm looking forward to seeing these people. And then they kind of hit the big budget. And they have to deal with, like, well, where's the line between, like, what they want to do and, like, versus maybe what, like, the big studio wants to do, yeah. right? Like, I, like, with, like, especially, like, I think Chloe Zhao is actually a perfect example. Like, I really want to love Eternals, but it's such a movie that, like, tears me in two. Because I think if Chloe Zhao had more control, it's a better movie. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. But if Kevin Feige had more control, I think it's a better movie. But their marriage just didn't make sense. Yeah, because she was more on the independent side. Like mm-hmm. I know, I know for that scene on the clifftop, she that that was a scene that she fought for to keep it shot naturally. Mm-hmm. That they were actually there. So I and then I actually in another friend group, another friend group shop I have, uh, they brought up where how like I think who, who was the filmmaker um, George Lucas mm-hmm. well, well George Lucas basically kind of got kicked out of Hollywood essentially you know because he didn't want to like conform mm-hmm. to you know the Hollywood practices and I think it's very reminiscent of like studios just kind of wanting to make movies for the big for just to make money yeah you know because if you think about like the golden age of Hollywood back from like what the 30s up until the 60s and maybe the American New Wave all well, the new Hollywood you know with Spielberg Scorsese all those guys coming in um, the studios really like the studio owners were really on top of their game of like all right like whatever is great for the storytelling of the picture itself I feel like now it's translated especially with the whole Warner Brothers fiasco of the like, Co- um, Coyote versus Ackman right or it's like it's just like oh, if dude, they don't right. think if they don't think it's gonna make a buck or if they don't think like if it doesn't test well in the Warner audience Brother. polls which you can't really do for the story you can't do that for emotion you know you can't test emotion I yeah. think of like yeah. just like wait, it was a Cronenberg who was like video uh, video uh, who was testing out um, for Videodrome and all the like the notes back from the testing were just like garbage hate this movie yeah. what was this and it's like now it's like certified like a classic yeah, in yeah. His <laughs> and that, that, that's that, funny how it works yeah, right? that, that's the one with uh, James Woods right I think I believe yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah no like you're right it, it's, just, it's funny how it's just like and also, I think it goes into the factor of, like, I mean, Cronenberg, you could kind of consider Cronenberg a bit of an auteur, because he, he very has a specific style, you know, he has a specific kind of, like, way he does things, especially with the genres, and I think it's just, I think it just goes to show about that not everything's for everyone, you know, like, like you know, a lot of the cult classics out there find their audience sooner or later. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I guess we could just pivot, you know, instead of just, you know, like... Who are some like up and coming auteurs 
that we should be on the lookout for. I think that's a good way to kind of maybe. Well, I think someone you mentioned earlier would definitely be uh, Emerald Fennel, if I'm pronouncing yes. her name yeah. correctly. Like she's definitely Saltburn. Like I haven't, haven't seen Saltburn yet. This guy had a what? Saw the premiere of it at a special screening. Technically uh, unemployed. One of the snobs, snobs was snob. at the snob. early screening for. Snob. You just kind of revealed who was there. Then yeah. you're kind of lying. Yeah. You're lying! <laughs> but that being said, like, after watching Saltburn, like, Emerald Fennel is definitely something everyone, someone everyone should have their eye out for. Um, because holy crap, did she make a movie that is just entirely her. And I've already recommended, like, two other people to go watch it, and both of them came back, like, glowing. Like, this movie is a must-watch, and already one of my favorites of the year. Um, yeah, I mean, aside from that, I would say, um... What was it Daniel and Michael Filippo, the the Rock Racket Brothers, mm. uh, would talk to me. I think I think uh, they definitely have a, a very good sense of style and a unique twist on that genre. Because I mean, essentially, I mean, if you if you put it to that, to the basics of Talk to Me, it's just like a, a movie about a girl getting possessed, mm. which has been done time and time again. Yeah. But like when I was watching it, like even my dad, like my dad's very hard on movies. Like he'll like you know he wants something different each time he liked talking to me because he thought it was very original you know he thought it was very good so it was like that was a shock to me so I was, I was very happy about that one when after we watched the movie and he gave his uh, uh critique on it but i think they're definitely a a, a a duo that we should keep an eye out you know like see, see what else they do yeah i got one more and then okay, i'll ahead. let you go no i was just gonna definitely say it and just because i really i had like this like love hate relationship for a sec, and then I was like, "Wait, why? Why, why am I doing this?" But, and I, re I finally clicked. Was Ari Aster? Yeah. Like I know he's kind of hit the three films, but after Bo's Afraid, just like certifiably, like whatever he does next, I will be there opening day. <laughs> I still haven't seen that one. Bo's was Afraid. I still haven't seen it either. But no, go ahead. Ooh, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but I I would still categorize Jordan Peele because I really want to see his next. What I have a feeling that he's gonna be one of those. Uh, tours that is going to switch it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. Like I, I know, I, I feel like he will. I feel like he will. So I think, I think it'll yeah. be that he'll switch it up, but it'll still be like okay, I, like this is still a Jordan Peele film. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Like, like kind of like Scorsese with The Wolf of Wall Street and Kills of the Flower Moon, where it's like he basically, switched it up, but it's basically. Like, this is still a Scorsese film. Yeah. But yeah, um, and, and, and the other ones. I mean, I know another one too. Which he kind of varies, but he keeps the same energy and he keeps the same like almost pacing, like the same like uh, rhythmic pacing throughout his films. Would be uh, Damien Chazelle. Oh yeah, Ooh. yeah, and truly divisive with his last movie. Babylon was good. I love. I Babylon. am a Babylon high yeah. right here. Yeah, no, I love Babylon. I think. Like I think he does the same kind of like I said the rhythmic like the rhythm the rhythm that he follows mm -hmm. is the same with La La Land the same with Babylon the same with uh, Whiplash so yeah he's definitely uh, one to uh, I'm excited to see what his next project is as Jordan Peele have they announced any of their projects yet or what? they are I, I don't think so they're cooking they're cooking something I don't know. But yeah, I think, um, I don't know, if I, I if we keep naming filmmakers, we'll we're never yeah, yeah. going to stop. But like, what's a movie that, wasn't that tour movie, film oh, that you want to recommend? Oh, I mean, Tona, you, let, let's... Ooh, okay. I, oh, I was going to save this maybe for more of our Christmas episode, but I'll just save the more in-depth conversation for that. But I'm always going to recommend David Lowry's The Great Night. <laughs> I walked out of that film like, just like this, that movie was my jam. Like, I, not every, it seemed like everybody I knew hated it for being this weird slog, but I was all in on its, like, strangeness. I loved his interpretation of that original, like, kind of, like, it was only, like, a 60-page poem that, like, was recovered, and it, it is a gorgeous piece of filmmaking with so much interpretation and so much different, like, just, like, visual styles. Like, it is, that is my recommendation, and I'll save the rest for when we get into our Christmas episode. Nice. Um, for me, it's like one of his, for me, it's gonna be one of his most like, um, not as popular as his other films, but old. Mm. <laughs> I, I just like, I, I think when you think of old, that's like M. Night Shyamalan's like craziness, mm -hmm. but it also feels like a B movie mixed together. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it incorporates like, basically everything that is great about M. Night Shyamalan, there is like, there's not really a twist, but it's also like, 
There's kind of like some, some bad acting in there, which I like. It's kind of campy. I don't know. It's great. It's a twisty story, and I like it. That's just that's just something I would recommend. Or in The Dark Knight Rises, obviously. Heath Ledger as Joker, so. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with... Uh, I was going to say one movie that I've already mentioned a bunch of times before, but Nerd. I don't want to sound like a broken record either, and it's kind of a depressing movie too, so I'm not going to say that one. <laughs> but, uh, but what I'm going to go with is Persona by Ingmar Bergman. You know, I think it's a great piece of filmmaking. It's a chamber film, which a chamber film is basically a film that just takes place in one location, primarily. You know, they could have some subsettings that, like, just kind of guide the story along. But, um, yeah, I don't want to give away too much about it just because it's very... It's very hard to give away, but it's also something you just gotta experience when you watch it. So I'll definitely recommend Persona. You know, great actors. I think there's just two actors in it. And you know, again, just I think that's like going back to the original definition of a tour, it would be, you know, him. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um any, our... any final thoughts or anything? I think I reset a lot. Yeah, we said <laughs> a lot. This has been the uh, Unemployed Film Styles version of Film Theory 101. <laughs> Hopefully we did a better job than your typical film school. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, um guys, if you have any auteur filmmakers that we probably didn't mention or forgot to mention, go, uh, as, please... go as crazy and extreme um, as please. you want. From yeah. like C movies. So we we did type on in our pre-meeting, like the B movie our tours, the C movie our tours. Neil Br Green, Tommy oh, Wiseau. So go as crazy as you want. Comment Bad down movies. below, yes. you know, American, Western, you know, uh, Eastern stuff, whatever. Like, just just bring it on. Like, let, let's see some new movie recommendations that we haven't watched yet. Yeah, or maybe we've seen everything. I don't know. Or some uh, some B movies and C movies from foreign stuff that we may not know. Even, yeah, even or I'm, this guy. <laughs> like, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything. <laughs> um, but anyway, guys, um, that's been our episode. Um, I do appreciate you guys if you made it to the end. Shout out to you. Let it, Comment down below. Like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, follow our Spotify. Follow our Apple. And then follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and TikTok. This has been your host, Brian Delgado. I'm Joshua Mejia. And I'm Joshua Latona. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.